folks, you know you're in for a treat when you hear that sound because it's time for another edition of the Rec Poker Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Reed, here to talk you through the forums edition of the show this week. So I'd like to thank our uh, wonderful sponsors, Website Amp and Running Aces Hotel, Racetrack and Casino. I have the best job in the world, so I'm here talking poker strategy with this amazing panel of Rec Poker Wizards. Uh, Wizards, why don't you tell a little bit about yourselves? I'm John Somsky, and I am also known as Poker Geek MN just about everywhere. I'm Kim Kilroy. I'm pet vet everywhere except on Poker Stars, where I'm Fergie 56. And look out if you've got her on your left. She's a shark. As I said before, I'm Jim Reed, Bluff Serini in the home game. And if you want to find out more about me and Kim and John and all the other wreckers on the wrecking crew, uh, you can go to wreck.poker slash crew. So every week we are battling against each other in the Rec Poker uh, home game on Poker Stars, the free money home game where we try and steal a pin by beating up on other folks in the Rec Poker uh, membership. And just like every week, we're going to take a forum post from the Rec Poker forums and talk about it here in the group. So we're looking at one today from Monkey System, Keith Brandt, uh, one of the great posters in, uh, in the Rec Poker forums. Keith actually recently did a session in the Focus where um, he was using GTO Plus to really break down an, uh, an amazing hand uh, that he and Chris Jones were working on. So hats off to you, Keith. That was really impressive. I hope um, you share more of that great uh, wisdom and experience with the rest of Rec Poker Nation because uh, that's a great, um, you, you know what you're doing with those solvers. I'd love to get more involved with that. So he's talking about uh, when to tighten up on final tables. And uh, in this case, he's talking about a hand from America's card room. Um, and I'm, there's a lot of interesting stuff here about this specific hand. But first, I want to talk just about this notion of tightening up on final tables. And should we tighten up? When should we tighten up? Are final tables the right place to tighten up? And sort of what are well, Kim, what do you think of when, when people ask this kind of question? What are the factors we should be thinking about? Well, I think if we're a short stack or a medium stack and we're before the bubble, we should be tightening up so we can make it through the bubble. Um, I think after the bubble, if we're a short stack, we don't need to tighten up anymore. We can play our range appropriately. Um, and then if we're sort of a middle stack, I think, you know, in general, when ICM factors are involved, I think we generally tighten up a little bit. So yeah, that's my that, opinion. And I most. think that's, you know, that, that medium stack is kind of the hardest stack to play in a way because the big stacks, they're not really at risk of going out. The small stacks, they're probably going out soon anyway, so they don't have as much to lose. It's that medium stack where you've got enough to lose that you don't want to get out, but you don't have so many chips that you can start pushing people around. Um, it is it is kind of a delicate spot. And Keith says here, um, most people tighten up on final tables with medium stacks, hoping to ladder up. But in the monkey system, we release the Kraken. <laughs> and he says, says there are a couple exceptions where we keep the Kraken in his cage. And um, one is where we have a medium stack and numerous stacks are so short they could go out at any time. And I think that's the real key. When we talk about medium stacks and short stacks, like we're kind of talking about, it's, it's the SOM skew ratio again. We talked about this a bit last week. You know, if there's a great disparity in the different stacks, then it, it's one situation. But if, if there's a lot of people with a short stack, then I think you really have to tighten up even more in that kind of a circumstance. And, and I think it depends a little bit on the pay jumps. Mm. If they're really flat in the beginning, then I don't think it's as important. Like it, so it depends. I and mean, if we're talking about two dollar pay jumps, or we're talking about two thousand dollar pay jumps, or twenty thousand dollar pay jumps. Like I think it depends. And, and it be, and it depends because it affects the decision making of the people in the hand, right? Like because mm -hmm. people will play differently on a two dollar pay jump than they will on a two thousand. Absolutely. Pay jump. Yeah. yeah. One, one example of that is for a while, the um, World Series of Poker, their main event, they guaranteed a first place prize of $1 million. And for the first couple of years when they were doing it, 
the prize pool was just barely big enough to handle that. So you might get $1 million for first and 200,000 for second, 100,000 for third or something along those lines. When the pay jumps are so big, it's almost like you're playing a winner takes all tournament. So you want to adjust more towards that style. Not that the second and third place prizes didn't mean anything, it just wasn't as significant. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one of those situations where you really have to be making good assumptions about your opponent um, because we've talked about this in the past. You know, you can be acting correctly, assuming that your opponents are also aware of ICM pressure, <laughs> but if they're not thinking about ICM, then you can't actually really apply ICM pressure to them. Um, and that's a way that we can all kind of get tripped up and maybe out-level ourselves or, or succumb to some fancy play syndrome where we're just not making good assumptions about, about the, our opponents at the table. And so I think that's what Kim is getting at too. When you think about player pool tendencies, how people are going, how aware people are going to be about how important this stuff is, particularly at the final table. And I know, you know, tournament structures vary a lot. And John, you can talk a little about this maybe, but um, when I was getting involved in poker, there was this general rule that sort of the top three positions was where the real money was. And so there is this kind of laddering. There's this ICM pressure on the pay jumps from like 12 to four, again, depending on the player pool, depending on the size of people in it. But um, which is why the final table presents this case. That's where the biggest pay jumps are. Um, John, is that something that's still kind of true as they flatten some structures and as uh, people... I think it's a little them? bit less true now that because structures are definitely flatter than they used to be. Uh, it used to be that 10% uh, or less of the field was right. paid out. Now, often you're seeing 15% of the field being paid out and you're not seeing the tournaments be quite as top-heavy. So uh, that leads to a little bit less variance. So it's probably a good thing overall, although it does mean that it caps the win rate for the best possible players. It, I mean, if you were the best players in the world and you didn't care about variance, then you'd be best off playing winner-take-all tournaments and only winner-take-all tournaments because you are going to get more than your fair share of first places. But in these days, uh, the fields are so close and there's so much variance involved that they're really working on flatten, flattening those structures. And, and, and there's an argument for that. You know, if you pay out more people less each, you know, you're kind of distributing that in the poker ecosystem a little more, more widely. The players that aren't, necessarily the best players are going to you know not to put it into mercenary terms they're going to lose their bankroll more slowly uh which is you know kind of one of those ecosystem questions that we have to talk about here um in the poker industry does that affect how either of you have have approached uh the final table or is it just a simple you're in a tournament this tournament has a certain structure that's how i'm thinking about the pay jumps in this structure yeah for me, really oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, I'm going to say I haven't been on final table. Then, so. <laughs> yeah, the ones I, I play for don't really, um, winning or losing them isn't going to make a substantial difference to my life. Uh, I'm not playing high enough stakes for that to matter. Right. Um, the, but you, you can see where flattening the structure will keep more money in the poker economy. If I were to win a $5,000 tournament or a $10,000 tournament, I will look at that as, wow, I just got five or $10,000 to add to my bankroll. If I win a million dollars in a tournament, I'm looking at, wow, I'm getting the house. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> you know, right. that money's not staying in the <laughs> poker economy. So that's one of the reasons why um, you're better off having these smaller things because it's more like uh, most of the poker money is recycled. Mm -hmm. When I uh, was playing online back before UIGEA, I was shocked. I had 
you know, I deposited maybe like $500 online. Occasionally I had a few thousand dollars online, but I had put over $200,000 of buy-ins through $10 tournaments. Yeah. And, you know, it wasn't, I never had $200,000 in my hand, but, you know, you play a $10 tournament, you get 15. Now you play another $10 tournament, you get nine or whatever it is. You keep on recycling that money. And if, if the prize pools are flatter, then there's more recycling going on. Yeah. And it's better Which means for in the, the end, the tournament or the poker sites are the real winners because they're taking all the rake. You're always one step ahead of me, John. That's exactly what I was going to say. So then, you know, they get to run, you know, they get the rake every tournament, um, no matter how many times they do it, no matter how many people are in there, they just get, a, get their little piece every time. So it's better for them to have people winning a little more often, playing more often, reinvesting that in the site. And, it, and you know, I mean, that is also better for everybody else, even the more skilled players in the big picture to have more people playing and enjoying the game and growing the game. So there is this kind of this, this trade off there. Um, so here, why don't we take a moment to hear from our friend Jonathan Little, and then we'll jump right back in here and talk about some more ICM related stuff. Have you ever wondered whether you should call a preflop raise or three bet instead? Oh, all the time. What do you do when you have a flush draw? Do you raise it or do you just call? What do you do with ace-king when you miss the flop? Ugh, tell us. Are you tired of guessing about what the right play is with your particular hand? <laughs> well, my name is Jonathan Little, and I am a two-time World Poker Tour champion and creator of PokerCoaching.com, where we offer over a thousand interactive hand quizzes where you play a hand and then get real-time feedback from our world-class pros. That's a lot of quizzes. Don't guess and don't stress. Just register for your free account at PokerCoaching.com slash RecPoker right now. I would do it, folks. And don't forget, he's going to give you that money back guarantee at pokergochen.com slash rec poker. Go check it out. <laughs> you heard nothing, John. Um, all right. So here we are. So how, how do we, so here, let, let's take another example where we feel like we're at a table where people aren't that savvy about ICM. How do we adjust to, to take advantage of that? Or how, like, how can we exploit opponents that, just don't understand that they should be paying more attention to, to ICM. What, how do we adjust in those spots? Fold more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what it really amounts to is because what, what it means is they are not going to understand how much pressure your bet is placing on them. So they are not going to give that the proper fold equity. You're not going to get as much as you normally would. And late in tournaments with ICM pressure, it's one of the times that your opponents can make moves that will end up hurting both of you. Mm. You know, normally if you are playing against one other person heads up, if they're doing something that helps you, it will hurt them or vice versa. If it hurts them, it will help you. But that's a case where you can basically, you are hurting both of yourselves and helping everyone else at the table. Right. Just, so if there's two people that are unaware of ICM and they're going up against each other, it's only benefiting you. Mm -hmm. There are two big stocks playing off against each other. Let them go because it's only the chips are coming. It's only helping your ICM. Yep. Yeah. Darrow Carney talked about that on an episode of the podcast recently um, about how you can really just stay out of the way and like, don't try and be the sheriff. Right. This isn't the time to be the sheriff. This isn't the time to step in and stop people from running the table. There, what's inevitably going to happen is the big stacks are going to run the table. And uh, it's it, it hurts you more to fight that than it does to just make good, smart poker decisions, make discipline falls, and let someone with less discipline than you lose next and uh, and ladder up as boring as it sounds and it sounds boring hmm. john i think you you're up to date on the thinking poker podcast i think you and i listened to the same one recently because i was going to say the same thing about we think it's like a zero-sum game um but it is this kind of situation where you know someone who's making a mistake at the table it can be a mistake that's bad for them but also bad for you and you just can't just them being wrong doesn't make it good for you it just makes it 
bad yeah. for them. <laughs> Think of it like, uh, let's say you're s both swimming in a race and one of them grabs a hold of your waist so that you can no longer swim properly. Well, that is bad for you. It also is bad for them because now they're just going to be going as fast as you can swim and nowhere else. So it's not, um, it's not a good strategy. And the thing is, it, unless you study it, it can be a little counterintuitive to understand the implications of ICM. The fact that your fifth chip is worse, l worth less than your first chip. You know, it, it, it's just, uh, it takes a while to get used to that thought process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you have to drill. I think you do have to use a, something like Range Trainer Pro or Float the Turn or some of these other apps or uh, uh, little training tools that you can use. You just have to be in this position a lot um, and kind of internalize it. And I think there's a lot of good work you can do in the lab off the felt, just kind of getting your ranges down because a lot of this stuff is pretty solved when you get to short stack poker, when it comes to, you know, again, assuming you're making good assumptions about the other people at the table. Um, I think there's discipline is, is your friend. Is there a way that we can make better assumptions about the people at our table? Or are there things that if someone at the final table does that immediately tells us, oh, I should tag this person a certain way or treat them in a certain way? I know when I'm in a spot, I'm always thinking, you know, earlier in the tournament, if I see people limping a lot, I might say, oh, okay, so this is a recreational player. I should try. I'm going to make certain assumptions about them. But when you get sort short stacked at the final table, I think more people are kind of finding that there's these valuable places in the decision tree for limping. And so that's less of a flag that it would be for other things. What, mm. what are some kind of the, okay, yeah, tell me a little about that, Kim. What? No, no, I don't, I don't necessarily agree or disagree with that. I just think that like, when you're short, like you should be just tightening up at the final table and you should just be going all in because yeah. it's it's one of those spots where ICM wise, you're gonna make much better hands fold, much better hands fold. So you should never be just limping or min raising as a short stack in, in that, in, in, the, in those spots. And, so and certainly, if I see people do that, then I think they're not ICM aware. Yeah. And then if I you see can them make... min raise and then fold from a short stack. Or I see them limp and then fold from a short stack. I, I see them as not ICM aware. And also calling just generally off a short stack. I think that's another situation where it depends on the, it depends on the spot, of course, and the sizing. But um, typically when you get into Only that in the big stack, blind. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. If I see someone calling in position for like, you know, an eighth of their stack or something like that, that usually tells me that I'm going to make some assumptions about them when it comes to the kind of ways they might be aggressive, the kind of ranges that might be playing. Um, they're not going to be someone that I'm going to tag as being, you know, ICM aware necessarily. So that, that's a good one. Anything, anything else like that? People that shove too deep or I mean it's amazing how deep you can shove these days according to uh, the solvers I, I think mostly ICM wise I don't think shoving is ever non like it's never bad <laughs> oh I'm so <laughs> glad to hear that Bluffsterini no. approved <laughs> I mean it's not, it may not be the highest ICM but it's yeah. not bad so as is folding right folding and shoving are never bad <laughs> <laughs> it's all the middle stuff <laughs> yeah and that is where you get in trouble and, and i mean part of the problem is that when we get into these icm spots in the final table short stacked it's just part of what a lot of us like about poker is kind of it's a different game you know like part of what we all like about poker is making big hands and you know post flop multi-street betting and like the intricacy of you know hand values changing and that kind of stuff and when you get down to short stacked final table like this, you need a different edge. And your, your, your edge has to be your understanding of ICM, opening ranges, shoving ranges, and just when to fold and just when to not get involved. And I think that, that's your biggest friend in, when it comes to these, these kind of spots. So it's, it's definitely a different, a different skill set. Um, I guess the last thing I want to ask you guys is how do you 
transition from that one player with a deeper stack to a different player with a shorter stack? How do you kind of adjust your mindset? And are there markers in the tournament that you, you know, once we get down to 27 people or once I get down to 20 big blinds or how do you decide how to change your style a little? What do you mean? Like, what do you mean one person with a short stack versus another person with a big stack? Oh, I just mean when I'm, when I'm playing my, when the effective stacks are bigger, I play a different ranges i play different style when your when your effective stack is bigger um i guess i mean like earlier in the tournament versus later in the tournament when 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 stacks generally um, right so is it is it i guess that's my other question Can, is it just stack size base um yeah yeah and i think so and and if we're if icm is involved so if it's stack size based and ICM isn't involved, you're going to shove a lot, a right. lot wider than you would shove if ICM was involved. So when you're short stacked earlier in a tournament and you're nowhere near the bubble, like there's no risk to you, you're already mm -hmm. going to go out. Mm -hmm. You're already going to go out. So mm -hmm. why not just take, take the risk and try and double up and try and get a stack to play. So I mean, I don't, I don't mean you should be shoving garbage, but you should just know your stacks and your, and your shove full charts for your stack size and like play them accordingly from yeah. your position. Um, but when you're in the money and ICM is a factor, I think that makes a difference. Or if you're on the bubble and ICM is the big factor, that makes a bigger difference. Yeah. And that, and that's really what we're talking about is like, how much of a difference should ICM make from not very much at all to quite a bit? And it's sort of where you are in the tournament has a lot to do with that. John, did you want to jump off on that? Well, yeah, I was going to say, you, you can look for other things too, like, um, I, I, I think of it a little bit like the effective, effective stack size. If you, let's say you're, you are, uh, in like the cutoff or something like that. And most of the people behind you are sitting there on 20 big blinds. You've got one player with 50 big blinds, but they are playing so tight mm. that you can almost ignore them. So then you can kind of take that player out of the, the player pool as far as your thought or, or lessen the impact of their 50 big blind stack because it's not going to be in play very often. Um, or if you see someone who is just shoving way too often or shoving you know, a 30 big blind stack a lot, you might wanna tighten up a little bit more because you don't wanna risk that much of your stack and you don't wanna be giving them portions of yours. So it's really a lot of little things you need to look at the, the table dynamics for that specific situation on how you might be able to do it. Do you, which players you wanna go after? And it's really hard to come up with a general guideline for all of the specifics yeah yeah so i think i think that icm is like it's not a factor at the beginning of the tournament it's like really low mm -hmm. and then as you approach the bubble icm becomes much more important and then after the bubble it goes down again and then it becomes a much bigger factor again closer to the final table yeah yeah so, I think that's a great visual. That's the way I think about it too. And, and, you know, if, if you adjust appropriately, you should be just tightening up when that ICM factor is getting high and then you don't need to worry about it as much in those other portions of the tournament. And the, I guess the other time is when you are at the final table, if you're there with 12 big blinds and there's seven other people and they all have 50 plus, you're actually you're supposed to go out next. You're supposed to go out next. So <laughs> there, there is, there's really no, I, I mean, there's a little ICM pressure, but it, it's kind of liberating, right? Like you get yep. to be the one who's realizing your equity and shoving and putting it in the middle. And you have very little to lose, but everything to gain. Um, it's actually some of the most fun you can have in poker is being a short stack. And the really important thing about that is to choose who you're shoving against. Mm. So you choose those middle stacks when they're in the big blind. And you choose those, you know, you don't shove against the biggest stack when they're in right. the big blind. You shove against the medium stacks that have more to lose. That's right. And it, to... it again is because of that ICM pressure. 
they mm-hmm. have the most ICM pressure on them. Yeah. And even, even though it's not going to take them out of the tournament necessarily, um, they don't want to trade places with you and be the, now the new shortest stack where they're the next one to come out. So it's, it's, it's a little tricky. Well, they just have to have a really good hand to, to yes. call or go all in over the top, especially if there's a big stack after them to act. And that's, that, that's a great point too, because you're, real, you're also leveraging the position of the big stack on the table. Um, to, especially if you have some sort of tell on them or if you have a note on them that they, they're not very ICM aware, then you can take advantage of that by uh, shoving into their big blind knowing that other people are probably going to overfold because th- they don't get a chance to close the action against this big stack. So I like that. I like that too. Are we going to talk right. about this hand? I was going to say, I'm not sure we're actually going to get into <laughs> any of the details of the hand. I feel bad for Keith because he put mm-hmm. out this, uh, this nine, six, two hand. Maybe we'll actually save this for another episode. Um, Cause we got so much good conversation here about just the general notions of um, ICM. So yeah, I'll tell you what monkey system. I know you're listening. Um, we'll do the actual nine six hand on another episode because I had too much fun talking about this, and then we'll we'll, we'll release the kraken. We'll release the kraken on you with that one, Keith. All right, invite me back. I have some things to say. Our, oh, good. Okay, I'm looking forward to that one. <laughs> well, then, in the meantime, I'll say thank you to Running Aces Hotel, Racetrack, and Casino, and Website Amp, Monkey System, of course, and Kim Pet Vet Kilroy, John Somsky, Steve Fredlin, and everyone else. Thanks, team. See you again soon.